Hi everyone. So, uh, uh, welcome to our first meritorical lecture. And uh, we're actually going to cover uh, within this lecture two subjects. The first one uh, is the overview of the world economy, while the second is the gravity model of trade. Look, when you study a subject, uh, like international economics, it is uh, rather important uh, to see the bigger picture. And we can see the bigger picture by uh, looking at the data from the real world and, to see, and we need to see and understand uh, what is happening in the global economy. And the best way to do so is, of course, to look at, the, at some main uh, indicators of global economy. Uh, at the beginning, of course, we are interested which countries are, are the most important uh, players in the global economy. There are different ways of measuring it. On one hand, we can say, for example, that which country is the biggest. Well, of course, uh, in terms of land area. Of course, here, Russia wins in a landslide uh, but uh, this is something that you can actually check just by looking at at a map so we're gonna start our journey uh, by looking at the population and look in in this uh, in this uh, graph you see uh, areas with the highest population in 2019 in millions of people so let's uh, let's first look uh, at generally how many people in the world do we have well we have almost 8 billion people at the moment well the, we clearly see that the highest populated country is China uh, with around 1.5 billion people and uh, the close second is India. Uh, the third is European Union, but of course we need to remember that European Union is a collection of 27 countries, if we exclude, uh, if we exclude United Kingdom. And even though that this is a collection of 27 countries, it accounts for about uh, 400. 50 million people. Then uh, the uh, the fourth place uh, is the US with uh, uh, between 350 and 400 million people. The next two are Indonesia and uh, Pakistan. Well, but uh, the, I think the more interesting Mm, thing to see is how the world population has been evolving over time. And this is what we see on the next graph. Look, here we have, again, in millions uh, of people, population of the world between 1916 and 2019. So, we are covering the last 60 years. And what do we see here? First, this is not a trend line. This is actual data. And look, this data looks basically like a straight line. And what, uh, what do we see from here? That in 1960, in the world, we had a little bit above 3 billion people. And the population has been growing steadily and uh, by all means very, very fast. And uh, in 2019, we are reaching almost 8 billion people. And think about it this way. It took humankind thousands of years to reach 3 billion people. And then in the last 60 years, the number of people in the in the world has more than doubled. It's uh, it's five almost five billion additional people in last sixty 
years. So we can see that actually this trend, the growing population, uh, is especially been taking effect in the recent uh, years. And now, the question is, uh, is this happening all over the world? Actually, the answer is, of course, not. Look, when you see, for example, usually when we divide countries to those that grow relatively fast and relatively slow in terms of population, we use uh, we use the distinction based on the level of development of a country. And for what we can see uh, over here is that population of the European Union has been increasing, of course. But look, this line is looks very concave. It increases, but at the, at the decreasing rate. And uh, this is why we see that the line is getting flatter and flatter. And this is a trend that we observe generally uh, in uh, developed countries. So even the population still is rising pretty fast, the actually uh, the growth of population in developed countries is relatively uh, uh, relatively slow. The best example of it is Japan. Look, J uh, population of Japan wasn't growing very fast to begin with, but actually in the last 20 years and definitely in last uh, 10 years, we see that the population of Japan has been declining. Uh, which is a phenomenon that can be observed in general uh, in developed uh, world. But of course, there are, uh, it's not always like this. Like when we look at the UK, uh, we see that uh, we see that the population actually was uh, growing very slow between the 60s and the 2000s, but then the population started. Uh, to grow a little bit faster since the 2000s. And in case of the United States, well, we see here that, uh, that again, just like in case of the world population, we see the linear trend. Of course, the, uh, 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 the line has lower slope, but we see that population of US has been increasing more or less linearly, and it increased from around 180 80 million people in 1960s to almost 400 or uh, let's just say for 350 people in 2019. Okay, but of course, as you know, from all your economics classes and especially from your macroeconomics classes, uh, the way of measuring economic power of a country through population is not the best one. The better way is to use some production aggregate. But this, uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry, one more thing. Let's now look at, uh, I'm sorry, let's now look at, at developing countries. And in developing countries, uh, we see that actually the population, uh, is also increasing at a different phase. But when you look at Lesotho, over the last uh, 60 years, population more than doubled. Although as the population grew, the, the phase of increase started to decline. Uh, in case of Mauritius, we see the shape that resembles more the one we saw in the uh, European Union. But the interesting case is Nigeria, because look, in Nigeria, in 1960s, we had less than 50 million people. In 2019, we had more than 200 million people. So four, more than four times as much. And on this graph, we can actually see uh, that this curve actually looks very convex and that uh, population growth is actually increasing with time. Okay, but as I mentioned previously, uh, 
the population is not the best measure of the power of the economy. The best measures are best based on the level of production. This economy, uh, these economies uh, are able to uh, to obtain. Uh, so, but here we uh, encounter some additional issues. First issue is a difference between gross domestic product and gross national income. Because look, gross domestic product measures all the, uh, the value of all the goods that has been produced in a given economy. So within the borders of a country. Well, gross national income uh, measures uh, level of production uh, uh, produced by citizens of a given country. Let me give you an example to, 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 to show the distinction. If Mexican worker comes to United States and works in the United States, this calculates as a part of US GDP because the goods and services this person provides uh, are being produced in the United States. But this is a citizen of Mexico. So actually, uh, the goods and services this person is providing in the United States uh, are calculated, are counted into gross national income of Mexico. So, but of course, remember that this, uh, this difference uh, it is not only uh, attributable to labor. It also comes with all the factors of production. So uh, if a, one company produces go uh, that originates in Mexico, produces in the United States, it comes in GDP of the United States, but in GNI of, uh, of Mexico. So um, what is the difference between the two? We can calculate gross national income as uh, GDP corrected for net receipts of factor income. So basically those are the differences associated with factors of production being used in a different country than the country of origin. And look, uh, when you will have uh, workshops with Yana, she will be discussing uh, balance of payments with you. And uh, actually the, the, uh, she will tell you about this a little bit more. In the lecture, we will go back to balance of payment a little bit later uh, when we will move to international macroeconomics. But the important thing to remember here is that actually this distinction does not matter that much because those two values are going pari passu. So uh, when we look at GDP and GNI, they are usually of the same magnitude. Uh, the differences are, the big differences are only present in small countries, uh, in, in small countries where a big share of a population works for different countries. For example, when you have a country that is based on an island and people from this country works as sailors for freighters for, from other countries, then the, distinct, the distinction can be big, but in general, it's almost uh, it, it can, it's negligible in terms of comparison. But there's a second problem <coughs> in comparing uh, economies, and this is associated with exchange rate. Because look, now let's say we've got Poland and Germany. Germany's GDP is expressed in euros. Polish GDP is expressed in uh, zloty. So how do we compare them? Well, the easiest way would be to use the exchange rate, like exchange rate for the average exchange rate over the entire period, multiply by exchange rate Polish uh, GDP, and we are getting German GDP. But here is a little trap that actually leads 
to underestimating Polish GDP. The distinction here that we need to make is that some goods are tradable and some goods are non-tradable goods. Tradable goods are generally the goods that can be traded internationally. TVs, cars, uh, uh, like TVs, cars, agricultural products. Uh, and those goods are getting international prices, right? On the other hand, uh, there are non-tradable goods, like hairstylist hair services. Uh, the, generally, hairstylists from, uh, from different cities do not compete for the same customers. So, uh, so actually, the prices of the uh, of these uh, of these uh, services in different countries can vary quite a lot and look this brings us to another problem because a when a wage level in a country is associated with the productivity but productivity um, uh, in the uh, is different uh, in the uh, tradable sectors when there is stronger competition and non-tradable sectors when there is smaller competition. But look, wage, on the other hand, uh, in a given country is some average wage for both tradable and non-tradable uh, sectors simply because within the same country uh, companies compete for the same workers uh, 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 okay, a uh, a companies within the same country but from different sectors compete for the same workers. So we expect, like, if Germany has higher productivity, they will have higher wage. With higher wage, they will have higher cost of producing non-tradable goods, and by that, and due to that, non-tradable goods will be more valued, even though the productivity in both countries, in non-tradable goods sectors, can be very similar. So, if we would just multiply value of the goods by exchange rate, we would be undervaluing exchange rate of Poland, uh, uh, GDP of Poland, and overvalued GDP of Germany. In order to correct that, we uh, we can use purchasing power parity. Another term that will be explained in more detail in the future, but basically some international organization collects uh, data on prices of different goods and makes corrections, and they make corrections in order to make GDP or GNI more comparable. Okay, so now let's look at areas of the world with the highest uh, GNR. Uh, look, at the, again, we can start with the words gross national income, which is actually, in case of the word, equal to gross domestic product in 2019. And uh, now look, here we've got billions of dollars. So, if I'm gonna cut those three zeros, we've got 120 trillion dollars. So we can say that world GDP is about 140 trillion dollars in 2019. Now, what, what, what are the bigger, biggest players in the economy uh, in the world economy? China. Definitely number one with more than 20 trillion dollars GDP, followed by US and the EU. But look, China has more, has, has around 1.5 billion people. United States, 380 million and European Union, uh, 300, I'm sorry, 450 million people. Then it follows by India, which again has a lot, a lot, what, like one, four billion people. And then we've got Japan and Germany, we, which have 
uh, uh, which have more than 100 and uh, about 80, 60, 80, 80 million people. So this should give us another indication of what we should look for. Like China produces the most, but it uses so many people to produce only a little bit more than the United States, which uses uh, b uh, uh, between four and five times less people. So how can we, so how can we make this, the, uh, the, uh, so what should we take into consideration here? Well, as you all know from macroeconomics, we should compare GDP per capita. GDP per capita will give us some indication of average wealth in the, uh, in the country. Remember, it does not tell us anything about the distribution of wealth. We can have a situation in which 1% of people are very uh, rich, the rest are very poor, but on average, uh, we get a, a country that looks relatively rich. But we are not going to be talking about normative economics in this class, so let's just look at how GDP per capita uh, uh, in the world looks like. So, first, uh, we see over here the countries with the highest GDP per capita, of course, in real dollars uh, and uh, in purchasing power parity. Here we have just dollars. So, look, we see that the richest country is actually, uh, or territory, uh, is Macau with, uh, let's just say, $130,000 per person per year. Uh, and the next one is Luxembourg, then it's Singapore, Qatar, Ireland, Switzerland. Now, the question is... Uh, is there any difference between what we saw before? Look, none of the, those countries were on the previous list. Actually, we see that all these countries are very, very small. So, uh, what makes them so rich? Well, actually, when you have a small country that, it, that, that has a high productivity in some sectors, for example, it just in some sectors, it's relatively easy for this country to get very rich. For example, Luxembourg and Switzerland are very famous for their high productivity in financial services. Uh, Singapore and Macau are a small countries uh, that trade quite a lot and they, uh, they add a, a, a and they add a lot of value added to the to the goods they import from other countries and they then re-export. Qatar, on the other hand, uh, it has great resources. So as you see, when you have a small country with uh, the, the with high productivity in one of its leading sectors, it can achieve high level of income. Uh, uh, quite easily. But now, let's look at the world GDP per capita and let's look how it changed over time. And look, first thing we see is that it grows rather fast. So, in 1990s, uh, world GDP was around $5,000. Well, uh, slightly above. But in 2019, it was, let's just say, $18,000. So increase is quite big. And we see that this increase is relatively steady. And actually, it looks like GDP per capita, core GDP per capita, increases faster than proportionally. The, 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 the line here has a conca convex shape. So does it mean that uh, situation in the entire world is improving well unfortunately it does not look that good when we for example 
make the distinction like the distinction made by uh, World Bank between high income, middle income and low income countries, we see a very different picture. Look, here we see that low income countries are maintaining a uh, low level of GDP per capita. Look, it's increasing, but it's increasing very, very slowly in comparison, even with middle income countries where GDP per capita is increasing slightly faster. But then when we look at high income countries, we see that this is the source of the increase in the world of GDP per capita. Actually, again, what we see on this graph is that rich countries are getting richer and richer while middle and uh, low income countries are basically remaining at the same level in case of low income countries or increasing their wealth very slowly in case of middle income countries. Now, when we look <coughs> at GDP, uh, per capita in, in selected country, in some selected countries between 1919 and 2019, what do we see is that Luxembourg and Singapore, small countries that are already has been very rich, have been accumulating their wealth the fastest and the level of GDP per capita in those countries are is rising the fastest. Then we have bigger economies, but rich like uh, Belgium, uh, UK or Japan. In those countries, GDP per capita is increasing, but it's increasing at slower pace. Then when we move still, remember, all those countries that you see over here are OECD countries. There are developed countries. But even within this group, we see that Mexico's real GDP per capita has been roughly, uh, it has been increasing very slowly. And, uh, but of course, in case of a country like Poland, it's also increasing relatively slowly, but the pace has been uh, catching up in the most recent years. Okay. So the main, the first part of our course is associated with trade. So now it's a good idea to look at the word trade. And look, we're going to be looking, what we looking at here are the word exports. But look, word exports expressed as a percentage of GDP. This is very important because remember what we saw before is that word GDP per capita has been increasing while the population has been increasing, which means the GDP actually is increasing faster than population. So we clearly see that in the world, world GDP is increasing faster than population. Now we are expressing exports as a percentage of GDP. So look, if uh, what exports as percentage of GDP is increasing, it means that exports are increasing faster than GDP. And this is basically what we see over here. Look, in 1970s, uh, exports as a share of GDP was about 12%, 12, 13%. In 2019, it was 32%. So look, we had almost uh, two times more uh, exports as a share of GDP uh, than uh, in the 1790s. And look, uh, of course, we see that this trend uh, is not as smooth as in the other graphs. But remember, there are two factors uh, uh, coming into play that uh, differences in the face of uh, globalization. And uh, of course, uh, 
uh, we uh, on one hand that produce those uh, uh, results on the hand of export and again all the uh, uh, problems associated with global business cycles uh, that are producing this more volatile shape but look we clearly see that over last 50 years tariffs and quotas in the world uh, were going lower and lower and lower due to the works of organizations like World Trade Organization and God before, we will discuss it later, due to creation of uh, supranational bodies like European Union or ASEAN, in which uh, uh, tariffs are either eliminated or reduced. And we see that it worked out that uh, now uh, trade um, amounts to about uh, over 30% of GDP. And uh, when you look at this graph, I think the most interesting feature is what you see over here in 2009. This period is known as the Great Trade Collapse, collapse that followed uh, uh, the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. And look, those, th this was the period when GDP falled very sharply all over the world. But, look, trade has actually fallen even more. Uh, uh, this is why it was called Great Trade Collapse, and, there have been, uh, and it actually produced a number of papers explaining why actually world exports dropped so sharply. And I think the leading explanation for that are the global value chains. Uh, so nowadays, uh, goods are produced in various different countries. So if you have a recession in a one country, it can spread more easily to other countries, but also it affects trade at different levels, uh, at different stages of production. And due to that, it creates... Uh, even the high, uh, higher uh, decrease in uh, trade than in uh, in uh, in the general level of production. Okay, now let's look at exports of some big countries, uh, and you see that basically everywhere we had uh, increasing trade, uh, increasing trend. I think the, uh, the, the, the the most interesting case is, of course, EU, uh, which due to decline uh, in trade barriers, which are basically non-existent at the moment, we have one European common market, has been increasing its trade uh, for quite a long time, and it, was and it was done very steadily. And the same picture you see in Germany, who is, of course, a member of European Union. Uh, in other countries like uh, India, uh, I'm sorry, 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 India, India, India is here, which is a big country. We see an increase and some slowdown in the recent years. USA, we see some increase, but it actually maintains at the same level. And please remember that actually US economy is considered a closed economy, and it makes perfect sense because look. When you trade between New York and Los Angeles, you have a distance between these two cities within one country higher than the many times than the distance between Warsaw and Berlin or Warsaw and Paris. So actually a lot of trade in the United States uh, take, takes place within the country. And then we've got uh, the, the most curious case is Canada, where actually you see the, the, the ratio of trade dropped from uh, almost 45% to over 30%. But again, this, uh, this is still quite high, especially for a big country like Canada. Okay, now let's look what's happening in smaller countries and as you see the differences here are quite big let's start with uh, with belgium and netherlands 
You see, actually, the pattern here is very similar. Those countries are very uh, uh, are uh, are uh, uh, are very open. More than fifty, and at this moment, around seventy percent of GDP uh, of exports uh, of uh, uh, of GDP is accounted by exports. Uh, and of course, it makes perfect sense uh, as those countries, of course, have big ports, especially the port in the Rotterdam, which covers a lot of trade in the European Union. But I, I, I think the most interesting cases are Hong Kong and Singapore. And look at this period over here. Singapore, since 2010, and Hong Kong, uh, well, be, between 2000, 2010 and 2010, had exports accounting for 200% of GDP. Well, when you think about it at the beginning, it makes no sense. G exports is a component of GDP. How can it be twice as big as GDP? Actually, this can be explained quite easily look singapore and hong kong are very small countries that trade trade a lot and of course hong kong a territory but let's call it a country uh so what do you see is like you when you uh, uh when you calculate gdp of course from exports you must uh subtract imports and those countries are importing a lot of goods semi products their work on them they add value to these products and they resell them on international markets and this is why G both gd uh, both imports and exports of those countries are accounting for up to 200 percent of their gdp okay so now uh, moving to our final uh, slide from this part of presentation, where did I get all this data? I didn't pull all the put all the data sources, and I did it on purpose because I wanted to. I want to now show you where you can get good quality data on the world economy. And remember, this is only a selection. The number of databases is way bigger, but the ones I'm going to uh, show you over here are very repu reputable. Plus, uh, uh, the amount of data you can find find in them uh, is extremely extensive. And remember, this will be very important for you as you are writing your uh, 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 your bachelor thesis, where you need to create econometric model. Okay, so look, I've put all the links over here in the presentation. I also prepared a separate file with all the links uh, on Zasobe, and I also placed all the links in the description of the video uh, here on YouTube. So please try these databases and now let me just uh, go to these databases and uh, show you a little bit what you can find in them. So uh, give me a second. So let's start with World Bank. Look, I actually am showing you two sites. In, over here in World Bank indicators, you have a division of different aggregates and measures you can obtain. They are divided here in infrastructure, external debt, gender issues, infrastructure in different countries. <coughs> but let's use the one that interests us the most, economy and growth. And here you see you can find GDP growth, GDP per capita growth, uh, GDP per capita in purchasing power parity, balance of payments, exports of goods and services. Look, you will also find detailed description of uh, all the uh, all the indicators you can find in here, 
and what is important, the data here is basically for every country in the world, which is, uh, which is a very powerful thing. Now, the next site is called, uh, it's also World Bank, but look, I, I, I wanted to show you this one because uh, over here you can do a, a bulk downloads. So basically, you go over here, you click Excel download, and you can download a very big uh, data files with various different indicators that will uh, allow you to put all the data in one place. You can also download it in CSV format, co comma separated values. It is useful because it takes way less place on your hard drive. And sometimes when your PC especially does not have enough RAM, it's really hard to load a, a very big data. Okay, the next database is called Pen World Table that you can find over here. And now look, you can download a file uh, uh, from this over here. Here you have all the bibliographic information. Here is even a paper, a link to a paper that actually will show you, explain to you how all the data was constructed. This is a very, very famous set of, uh, of data, very often used by scientists all over the world. I also put it on your Zasobe. And let me open it. Uh, to see, look, this is especially uh, important when you wanted to do some macroeconomic comparisons between the countries. Because what do we have here? GDP, uh, population, employment, working hours, even the measures of human capital between the countries. Expenditure side GDP, output side GDP, total factor productivity, capital stock in the economy. Exchange rates, ratio, uh, 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 you, you've got shares of household consumption, government consumption, uh, as well as indicators for price level. Uh, th th this data set is not very big, but it, for most of the countries you get data from 1970, but for some of the countries, even from 1950s to 2017, so as you see, you get very long time series of uh, data. Okay, so finally, the last one I wanted to show you uh, is uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, here, when you go to data section, you will find plenty of uh, specialized databases that will allow you to get indicators on things you uh, you want to uh, you want to examine I believe for this class the two are the most important so I'm gonna just talk about the two and those two are directions of trade that you can find over here but I already clicked here to directions of trade and this is amazing database it has data on bilateral trade so trade in between any pairs of countries but there is a, there is a but here you need to sign in otherwise you cannot use it in order to sign in you need to first register I already registered many years ago so I cannot show you how to do it but important thing is if you want to register you need to use Lazarski email look when I'm signing in over here I'm using Lazarski email because this is a work email. Uh, you can use your Lazarski email that you can get from IT office, logged in here, and then you can explore the data as you want. And now look, here actually uh, the tools for the data download are very well constructed. I recommend you to go to bulk download and look, you will be doing gravity model of trade as a project for your uh, 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 for your workshops and you will be using exactly this data. So let me show you how it works. Here you can uh, choose, okay, first frequency of data. When we talk about trade data, most of the time we don't need quarterly data. 
annual data is okay as you will learn uh, uh, especially in the context of international trade economics we talk about long run tendencies and they are actually exhibited uh, uh, in yearly data better than quarterly or monthly sometimes in macroeconomic context we use quarterly uh, data very uh, in a very but uh, not very often monthly data but it's good that it you, we can have it. then you can here you will check uh, uh, you can check uh, 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 a time period you want to use okay let's say we want to have data from 1990 till 2019 and now you can choose a country here the best way to start is deselect everything and look you choose the first country. Let's just say I want to know how Poland trades with other countries. So I need to find Poland. And done. You can pick here as many countries or country groupings as you want. Then you pick an indicator. It can be imports exports as you see or a uh, trade balance so exports plus imports but exports going with minus and uh, here you have different uh, ways of measuring cost of insurance free and board well cost of insurance uh, is the best way to uh, actually calculate trade uh, for reasons that we do not have uh, time to discuss but remember, imports of one of Poland to Germany are exports of Germany to Poland. So remember, once you have data on imports, you can always get the data on exports. It just needs to be smart about it. And now look, you choose here uh, country partners. Let's just say I want to know how much Poland trades with Germany. and uh, uh, it doesn't matter Angola okay and look now I'm just clicking okay and now this uh, now the, the site has prepared a file for you this is a CSV file comma separated value so if you want to use Excel file you just need to change commas uh, dots into commas which is very easy you go to my downloads sometimes it's taking quite a while but here you will be able to to find the data okay the same thing is true for international financial statistics um, sorry so oh it's already here so you see this is my, uh, I can download the data over here. I got it in CSV file. Now, uh, if you wanna, you wanna have it in Excel file, remember you go to data, uh, text as columns, and then you go next, next, done. Oh, I'm sorry, something went well. Uh, something went wrong uh, probably sometimes we need to do it separately for the uh, headers oh, okay I know what it's what it is okay we will have to use uh, division by comma And sometimes, as you see, because there was too many commas, oh, I, 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 I never thought that those databases were perfect, but uh, sometimes, but this is more of an Excel problem. Uh, okay, let me just delete this. Uh, move to the left, 
and now you have all the data that you needed. Okay, and of course the last thing uh, is international financial statistics, but look, it works in exactly the same way. You have data explorer here that works uh, in a similar fashion uh, so you can use it. And okay, I know that we've reaching almost an hour. So this is it. In the next part, we are going to discuss the gravity uh, model of trade. Okay, take care. Bye.